Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Edward Arnold and Faye Bainter in The War Against Mrs. Hadley with Gene Rogers and Van Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. History begins at home. It begins in the homes of Kansas and the great western plain, in the homes of Pittsburgh and the Valley of Steel, in the homes of San Francisco and a dozen other cities that turn out the men who build the ships. And it begins in a home in Washington called the White House. The sum of all these homes is America, and over every one of them is the shadow of great events in this year gone by. We do not celebrate this day, which marks the first anniversary of our active entrance into the war. We merely note its passing and turn to the challenge of the future. Tonight we tell you of the way one American home has met this challenge in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer drama, The War Against Mrs. Hadley. And you'll hear four of the players who were in the picture, Edward Arnold and Faye Bader, beloved for many fine performances here, and two promising newcomers to the stage, Gene Rogers and Van Johnson. All American homes have faced problems brought on by the war. This is what happened in the home of Stella Hadley. And behind the dramatic story of this one home is inspiration for every home. We're all working hard these days, doing what we can to help, and it's important that none of that effort be wasted. Waste is an enemy that must be fought on every front, but especially on the home front. And a strong ally in that fight is Lux Flakes. In Hollywood, for instance, our product saves motion picture studios thousands of dollars a year in various kinds of wardrobe care. That's a very interesting amount of money to the studio treasurer. And what's true in Hollywood is true in your own home, too. You may not be making motion pictures, but like us, you have a budget to meet. In these times, you need to make clothes last longer. And your friend in that need is a friend indeed. In two well-known words, Lux Flakes. Now, the signal for the curtain and the first act of the war against Mrs. Hadley, starring Edward Arnold as Elliot Fulton, Faye Bainter as Stella Hadley, with Gene Rogers as Patricia and Van Johnson as Michael. In November 1941, Mrs. Stella Hadley of Washington, D.C. wrote a letter to an old friend. While a worried world outside her window strove desperately to prepare against the mass murderers of Europe, Mrs. Hadley sat in the rich security of her drawing room, blind and deaf to everything except her own personal comfort. Washington, my dear, is a complete madhouse. The way people are rushing about and getting in each other's way. You think it was November 1917 instead of 1941. All very silly, of course. I suppose you know my son Ted is in the war department with Elliot Fulton. And Patricia's been pestering me for some vague idea she has of entertaining draftees at a canteen. I don't know what's getting into people, really. All this talk of war and defense and lend-lease is beginning to bore me. In spite of the warmongers here, I have it on excellent authority that the chances of peace were never better. Goodbye for the present, dear. And if you're in Washington next month, please come to my birthday luncheon. Remember the date. Sunday, December the 7th. Oh, good morning, Mr. Fulton. Good morning, Bennett. Am I the first? Yes, sir. Mrs. Hadley hasn't come down yet, but you'll find Miss Patricia in the drawing room, sir. Is that you, Elliot? Come in here. Oh, good morning, Pat. How's your mother? Full of birthday cheer. You look tired, darling. Well, I am a little, but don't tell your mother. She'll scold me for working nights. <laughs> What's new in the war department? How are the peace negotiations coming along with Japan? Ah, uh ah, -uh, Pat, you know my rule. No shop talk here. This is the only house in Washington I can forget all that. 
Mrs. Hadley's ivory tower. Elliot, will Mother ever ruffle up her tail feathers and pull that pretty head of hers out of the ground? Oh, mm, maybe she's lucky. She's missing a lot of unpleasant happenings above the ground. But other people have to face them. Why shouldn't she? Just because we live like kings and... Oh, now, don't be intolerant, Pat. It's just that she's living in the past, that's all. I can't say I blame her much. You know, she was the most popular girl in Washington until your father came along, and then she was the happiest wife. Elliot, were you in love with her then? Yes, but I made one fatal mistake. I introduced her to your father. <laughs> you know, you and Mother are my two favorite people. Why don't you get married? I've always wanted to be a flower girl. Oh, oh, oh I'm afraid you're out of luck. Why? <laughs> a nosy little baggage, aren't you? All right, if you really want to know, I'll tell you. I proposed to Stella on her last birthday. What did she say? Uh, she said I was the best friend your father ever had, the best friend she ever had, the best executor the estate ever had, and being a staunch Republican, I had no right to associate myself with those new dealers. <laughs> Hardly a direct answer. Hardly, but terribly final. Hello, Elias. You're early, aren't you? Oh, hello, Ted. Oh, my head's killing me. Good morning, brother dear. Oh, do you have to be so loud about it? I need a drink. Have one with me, Elliot? No, thanks. Big night, brother? Well, not big enough to deserve this, Ed. Oh, Elliot, uh, I'm sorry I had to leave the department so early yesterday. I, uh, I had to go to the dentist. Yeah, that's the fourth time this month, Ted. Yes, I know, uh, but... Ted, uh, have you seen Mother yet? Well, only one out of, out of one eye. She came into my room at the crack of dawn to see if I was resting peacefully. Won't one of you please tell her I'm old enough to be weaned? Keep pulling on that bottle and she'll find out soon enough. Good morning, good morning. Hello, Doctor. How are you, Meacham? Splendid, thank you. How are you, Doctor? Uh, Ted, let me see you. Oh, you look bilious, Ted. Now, don't try to drum up any trade with me. Stick to Mother. Have a drink, Doctor. I don't drink in the morning. How's your mother feeling, Patricia? She's thriving. Frankly, I've been a bit worried about her lately. She's uh, not really been strong since your poor father passed away. Oh, nonsense. She's as strong as an ox. My dear Fulton, I think I'm a better judge of Stella's condition than you are. Am I late? Oh, hello, hello Cecilia. How good are you? Morning. Hello, hello Elliot. How are you, Dr. Meacham? Quite well, Miss Talbot. Thank oh, you. Oh, what a time I had getting here. Where's Stella? Hasn't she come down yet? Now, Cecilia, you know well enough that Stella always waits for the last guest before she makes her grand entrance. What? Oh, well, I hope I haven't kept her waiting. Ted! Ted, darling, you look peaked. Well, that makes her practically unanimous. What? Oh. Oh, Elliot, is it true what they're saying about these little Japanese ambassadors of peace? Well, not knowing what they're saying, I can't tell you. Oh, oh no, of course not. But my elevator boy overheard someone tell someone else that they... Good morning, everyone. Good morning, oh, Stella. Good morning, Stella. Good morning, Stella. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Oh, what lovely flowers. It's like spring. Happy birthday, Mother. Teddy, darling, my pin is beautiful. You and Pat had no right to spend so much money. Don't give it a second thought, Princess. We charged it to you. I wish you had. Teddy, you look pale. Leonard, I do wish you'd have a look at him later on. Certainly. Oh, I'm all right, Mother. Won't do any harm for Leonard to have a look. But, Patricia, dear, put some powder on your nose. It's all shiny. How can I ever thank you all for my lovely gifts? Elliot, these earrings you sent me. Well, I'm glad you like them, Stella. I love them. And, Leonard, your fitted bag is just what I've always needed. I'm so glad. Did you like my gloves? Of course I did, Cecilia, dear. I helped you pick them out. It always amazes me that anyone remembers my birthday. Luncheon is served, Mrs. Hadley. Thank you, Bennett. And may I take this opportunity of wishing you happiness, Mrs. Hadley? Bennett, how nice of you to remember. Come along, everyone. Thank you. Oh, that was a mighty fine lunch, Stella. I always say you set the best table in Washington. Thank you, Leonard. Oh, Stella, dear. Boston Symphony. What, Cecilia? It's time for the Boston Symphony. They're playing Beethoven's uh, uh, Fifth. Very well, Patricia, dear. Turn on the radio, please. Yes, Mother. Well, Stella, I'll have to be running along. Now, Elliot, and... sit down. You're not going to do any more work this afternoon. Oh, what a perfect day. All my loved ones here to help me celebrate. Mrs. Hadley. Yes, Millie. Serve the coffee in here, please. Yes, Mrs. Hadley. And be careful of those cups, Millie. 
They were a gift from President Coolidge. Yes, Mrs. Hadley. The guy was alive with planes spitting death and destruction on the harbor which lay below. The Patricia, exact turn number off of that dreadful gibberish. We want to hear the symphony. Here. I'm trying to find it, Mother. I don't know why they permit such programs on the Sabbath. At 1.5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the first planes appeared over the horizon. Patricia. Winging their way across the Pacific. Let Ted find it. These were followed by wave after wave of bombers. Pat. Wait a minute, something's happened. While in this Lillian, very city, please, not on my birthday. Quiet. And so, war has come to our country with a Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor? As yet, They've attacked Pearl Pearl Harbor. Really, it can't be true. Why, oh, it's impossible. So it's come. How could they do such a thing? Pearl Harbor. Oh, no. Really? I told you to be careful of those cups. Mrs. Hadley, my best service. Millie, you're impossible. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hadley. I couldn't help it. My brother's at Pearl Harbor. My brother. Oh, poor child. Go after her, Bennett. Tell her that I said she should go home and spend the night with her mother. Yes, madam. I'll never be able to replace this cup. This is never. the most outrageous breach of human decency ever perpetrated. Right in the middle of peace negotiations. Oh, my head is splitting. If you'll just turn it off for a moment. Turn it off, Ted. No, no, Stella, you really mustn't excite yourself. It's horrible. I can't believe it. Come on, Ted. We'd better get down to the department. Right. I'll get a cab. Ted, you're not going to leave me. Not on my birthday. In case you haven't heard, Mother, we've just gotten into a war. Yes, I know, dear. It's dreadful. That poor girl's brother. Maybe there's some more news. Don't turn that thing on again, please. All right, Mother, but I've got to know what's happening. Where are you going? Upstairs to listen to my radio. I've got to go too, Mother. Well, if you must, you must, but do be careful, dear. Don't worry, the Japs haven't gotten here yet. Teddy, you mustn't say such silly things, even in jest. Come along, Ted. Goodbye, Stella. I'll phone you later. Yes, do. I hope everything will be all right. Come on, Ted. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, darling. Oh. Oh, dear, dear. Stella, I think you ought to lie down for a while. Yes, Stella, you really should. Perhaps you're right. Birthdays are such a strain on one's nerves, the excitement and everything. Goodbye, my dears. And thank you for coming to my party. <laughs> uh, would you read back the last sentence I dictated? Yes, sir. The bombing of Pearl Harbor has shown us the path we must follow. And we must wipe out completely for the duration of the war the idea of business as usual. The... Mr. Fulton's office. One moment, please. It's Mrs. Hadley. I'll take him. Hello, Stella. Elliot, did you get my message? What message was that, Stella? Elliot, you know how hard Teddy's been working. You aren't really going to keep him at the department again tonight, are you? Well, why? Did he tell you I was? Why, of course he did. And war or no war. I think you should let him spend Christmas Eve with his mother. You may come too, Elliot. Well, thank you, Stella, but uh, I'm afraid I can't make it. I'll see what I can do about Ted. Send him as soon as you can. Yes, very well. Goodbye, Elliot. Bye, Stella. Here's the latest communique, Mr. Fulton. Uh, thank you. That'll be all for now, Miss Hart. Yes, sir. Oh, Bob, would you ask uh, Ted Hadley to come here a minute? Why, he's gone, sir. He's what? He's already left. Some of his friends called to take him out to the country for dinner. Oh, I see. Well, in about 10 or 15 minutes, call Mrs. Hadley and tell her I'm awfully sorry. But it's absolutely essential that Ted work tonight. Yes, sir. Look, Mr. Fulton, Ted's a friend of mine, and I don't want to seem a heel, but something ought to be done. Something is going to be done. I'm having him transferred. Transferred? Yes, into active service. I can't keep him around here anymore, even for his mother's sake. It's not fair to the department. I wish I could be transferred to active service, sir. Yeah, I know how you feel, Bob, but I can't spare you. Ted needs it much more than you do. This may be his one chance of making something of himself. What is it, Peters? Why aren't you down at the department to pick up Mr. Theodore? Well, I'm going right away, Mrs. Hadley, but uh, could I speak to you first, ma'am? Yes, of course, Peters. I, I had word for my draft board today... They've reclassified me in 1A. I have to report for service next week. Oh, that means you'll be leaving me. I'm afraid so, Mrs. Hadley. It won't be necessary. I'll speak to Mr. Fulton about it. Oh, uh, I'd sooner you wouldn't do that, ma'am. If they need me, I feel I ought to go. I'm sure that's very patriotic of you, Peters, but it isn't as if you aren't doing something. Why, you drive Mr. Theodore to the department every morning. Well, I know, ma'am, but it isn't quite the same thing. Well, of course, if you want to leave, if you think you'll be happier elsewhere... I certainly won't stand in your way. But I do think you could have given me a little more notice. But I only got my notice today. We won't discuss it, Peters. You may tell Bennett to give you two weeks' salary when you leave. Well, thank you, Mrs. Hadley. I'm sorry. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Hadley. Oh, but that's impossible. 
Mr. Fulton promised me faithfully he'd send Ted home. Well, I never heard of anything like that in my life. Keeping my own son away from me. Consideration for me, even if the government hasn't. All right, you win. I'm sorry I can't be here to help with the Christmas presents, but I've got to get an extra girl for canteen duty tonight. Patricia, is that the canteen that Laura Winters is running? Oh, Mother, she's just helping out. I shouldn't think you'd want to associate with the wife of the man who contaminated your father's newspaper. Contaminated? Oh, Mother, just because Father was a Republican and Mr. Winters is a Democrat... They turned the Chronicle into a Democratic scandal sheet. I should think you'd have more respect for your father's memory. Well, Laura Winters only comes down once in a while anyway. I hardly even know what she looks like. Good night, Mother. I've got to run. Can't you even be with us on Christmas Eve? I'm sorry. I wish I could, Mother, but it's Christmas Eve for the soldiers, too. Good night, dear. Good night. <laughs> Can you fill on the coffee, please? Got any more coffee, miss? Now, listen, soldier. How many cups does that make for you? Oh, just five. Or is it six? <laughs> How did you swallow that last one so fast? Well, confidentially, before the army got me, I used to be a fire eater. <laughs> What's your name, lady? My name is Pat. Pat? Mine's Mike. Oh. We ought to get together. <laughs> Say, couldn't you come over on my side of the counter for a while? Not while the rush is on. It doesn't seem right having a counter between us. Well, why don't you come over on my side? Do you mean it? Sure. Gangway. Gangway, get back here where you belong. Come on, what's the matter with you? Nice little place you've got back here. I I'm glad you like it. Uh, now you can put this apron on. Apron? What for? So you won't saw your uniform. I don't get it. Once you cross the counter, you're a worker. You're going to help me wash the dishes. Oh, oh yeah. no. You can always go back. You're a hard woman, Pat. Give me the apron. Right back here in the kitchen, soldier. Hey, Mike's on KP again. Look oh, at boy, him. Oh, look at him. <laughs> look at him wash your dishes in here. <laughs> Do you realize if you'd taken me home before the other girls, you could have saved yourself a lot of driving? Well, I don't know Washington very well. Then why did they pick you to drive us? The luck of the Irish and a dollar bill. <laughs> That's bribery, soldier. Now, you don't think I was going to let you out of my sight, do you? Not after that mountain of dishes I washed for you. <laughs> the next house on the right, please. The next house? What for? That's where I live. In there? Yes. What's the matter? It's awfully big. Oh, it isn't really. Looks awfully big to me. Well, I guess you must be kind of tired. Not especially. It's been swell knowing you. I suppose I'll be seeing you at the canteen sometime. Stop acting that way. Hmm? All right, so I live in a big house. I live in a small house. So you live in a small house and I live in a big house. Is that any reason to treat me as though I suddenly have the measles? What difference does it make? Oh, I'm sorry. It wouldn't make any difference, not with someone like you. Am I forgiven? If you promise never to let it happen again. It's a promise. And to seal it, I... I'll take you to see my house. Where do you live? Clary Street. At least Mother lives there. That's where I was born. I thought you said you didn't know Washington. I never really did until now. Pat. Yes? Pat, I... I never met a girl like you. I mean... <laughs> well, for the lover, did you see that? Right up behind us. I'll murder that guy. Why don't you look where you're going? Why, you... I'll kill him, so help me. Get out of that car, mister. Get out. Take your hands off. Come on, come on. Get out, you drunk. Mike, Mike, don't please. Let him alone. Well, hello, Pat. Hiya, sweetie. What did you call her? Mike, don't. He's my brother. Oh, glad to know you. <laughs> Patricia, who is this mother? Look here, you. If you weren't her brother, I'd not... Well, let's pretend I'm not. Shut up, Ted. I'm sorry, Mike. I'll call the camp in the morning and tell them what happened to the car. Oh, don't worry about that. You want me to help you get him inside? I don't need any help. Go on, soldier. Back to the war. Good night, Mike. I'm sorry it had to end like this. What do you mean, end? It's only just beginning. Merry Christmas, Pat. Merry Christmas, Mike. But it's impossible. They can't put you in the army, Ted. You're in the war department. No more, I'm not. Sit down, darling. You mustn't upset yourself. I'll phone Elliot right away. All he has to do is to tell the draft board that you're essential to him. But don't you understand, Mother? I'm not. Don't be so modest, darling. Of course you are. Any office boy, even a backward one, could do what I'm doing. Well, then Elliot will have to give you more responsibility. Hello? This is Mrs. Hadley. 
I'd like to speak to Mr. Fulton. Oh. Well, would you ask him to be good enough to call me when the conference is over? Thank you. I don't know how they accomplish anything in that department. They're always in conferences. Sit down, darling. Everything's going to be all right. I'm just going to get a drink, Mother. Darling, you know what alcohol does to your nervous system. I have a vague notion. Don't worry, please. Even if we didn't have Elliot, I could always get a certificate or something from Dr. Meacham saying that you weren't physically up to it. The army doctors decide that. I'm sure they're not nearly as thorough as Leonard. Oh, uh, Mrs. Hadley. Yes, Bennett. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Hadley, but word has just come over the radio. There's to be a practice blackout tonight. Whatever in the world for? Oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Thank you, Bennett. Madam, would it, uh, uh, would it inconvenience you very much if I... Uh, went out for a little while this evening? No, I suppose not. But isn't it rather an odd time to go out during a blackout? In a way, madam, yes, but it's most important. I, well, uh, I'm an air raid warden, madam. Bennett, I don't remember giving any permission for that. No, madam, but I thought seeing that everyone... That will is... do, Bennett. I'll speak to you later. Yes, thank you, madam. An air raid warden. Of all the ridiculous ideas. I don't know what's come over everyone. People acting so strangely. Good evening, Bennett. Good evening, oh, sir. That must be Leonard now. What's he want? He's giving me vitamin shots. In these times, it's so important to keep up one's energy. One never knows when it may be taxed. Come in, Leonard. <laughs> Mrs. Hadley is here, sir. Oh, send her in, please. Yes, sir. Mrs. Hadley? Well, well, this is a pleasant surprise, Stella. Mohammed wouldn't come to the mountain, so the mountain came to him. I've been trying to reach you since last night. I'm awfully sorry, Stella, but I've, I've really been swamped. Won't you sit down? Elliot, I want to speak to you about Teddy. Yes? Excuse me, sir. These communiques just came in. Oh, yes, let me see them. Oh, my, they're bombing Manila for the second time. And have to be declared in an open city. If you remember, I told you six months ago not to trust those Japanese. Now, about Teddy... Uh, uh, Bob, tell Miss Hart to call everyone for a conference in about ten minutes. Yes, sir. Now, what were you saying, Stella? I haven't said anything yet. Elliot, I want you to have a talk with Teddy. I did have a talk with him last night. He came over very late. Really? Strange he didn't mention it to me. Then you know all about this ridiculous notion of his. Well, I don't think there's anything ridiculous about a man wanting to serve his country. Oh, but it's different with Teddy. He's already working for his country. Much too hard, if you ask me. Oh, it's a pretty tough job, winning a war. All the more reason for not moving people from one thing to another. I'm sure even this administration wouldn't approve of that. Well, if Ted feels that he wants to join Teddy's up... Teddy's just I... a child. He doesn't know what he wants. He's just being headstrong and irrational. Did you tell him that? I refused to discuss it with him. After all, you and I are a lot older and more capable of deciding what's best for him. I think Ted has decided that for himself. Elliot, you act as if you were pleased at the prospect of his being sent to the Far East. Or one of those dreadful places. I'm pleased to know that he has the character and the courage to want to go. I wasn't quite sure how he would feel. You mean you knew about this? Yes, I did. But if you knew, why didn't you stop it? Elliot, you've got to stop it. There's nothing I can do, Stella. Well, you can keep him here with you. I know you can. You've always said you'd do anything for me. I only wish I could. If you care for me at all, if you care for Ted. If Ted were my own son, but I'd do exactly as I've done. he's not your son. He's my son. You had him drafted. Not satisfied with that, you talked him into wanting to go, to leave That me. isn't true, Stella. Whatever you may think of me, at least give Ted credit for making the decision himself. If anything should happen to him, it wouldn't matter to you. Stella, wait. I never want to see you again. Act two of The War Against Mrs. Hadley, starring Edward Arnold and Faye Bainter, with Gene Rogers and Van Johnson, will follow in just a moment. Now, between the acts, we've a letter from overseas to read you. And we'd like to thank Mrs. Betty Commande of Yonkers, New York, for sharing it with us. It's from an American lieutenant somewhere in England. Here's what he says. I received the following packages in the last two days. Soluble coffee. Thanks, Dad. Buttons for my uniform. Thanks, Dad. Shoebox containing what an assortment. 
Lux, candy, gum, raisins, and so forth. Many thanks, Marm, and many, many thanks for the Lux. Now I can wash my wool scarf. I wouldn't trust that scarf to the laundry. To be awakened out of a sound sleep and told you're a first lieutenant and to receive a box of Lux all on the same day is something to write home about. Then Mrs. Commande adds, I wonder how many mothers think of enclosing Lux in that wonder box. It is a thoughtful thing to do, for Lux takes just as good care of wool scarves and socks as it does of your precious sweaters and other washable woolens. You know how soft and attractive your sweaters stay when you Lux them, and you probably know how harsh and scratchy and shrunken woolens can get if they're not washed right, if they're rubbed with cake soap or washed with strong alkaline soap and too hot water. They're not very comfortable to wear when that happens, and they're actually not as warm to wear either. But with gentle Lux care, you can avoid shrinking and matting. There's no harmful alkali in Lux flakes, and there's no danger of that cake soap rubbing that's so apt to make wool shrink. So guard your precious woolens the gentle Lux way. And you'll get many thanks from your man in uniform if you enclose a box of Lux Flakes in the next package you send off to him. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of The War Against Mrs. Hadley, starring Edward Arnold as Elliot Fulton, Faye Bainter as Stella Hadley, with Gene Rogers as Patricia, and Van Johnson as Michael. Ted Hadley is in the army. Now more than ever, Mrs. Hadley is bitterly resentful of a war which has been thrust upon her, indignant at the changes it has made in her life. With Pat and Cecilia, she's driving down to visit her son at a camp near Washington. Are we almost there? It's just a little way, Mother. I don't see why they don't ever let Teddy come home. They're always keeping him in that camp. I'm not surprised. He's such a lovely boy. They do the same to all the boys, and they are letting him have dinner out with us. Who's the man he's bringing with him? Sergeant Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick? Oh, isn't he the young man you brought home one night? Yes, Mother. Dad, so that's why you're all dressed up. Oh, don't talk <laughs> nonsense, Cecilia. I didn't know he was a friend of Teddy's. I asked Mike to look Ted up at camp. They've become friends. I see. Oh, Stella, I meant to tell you, Tony Winters is at the same camp. Laura Winters' son. Did you know? No, I didn't. Oh, yes, they're taking all the boys. Why, my elevator boy says... Cecilia, I do wish you'd stop quoting that elevator boy. Well, he does run into a lot of important people. Teddy, dear, have you everything you need at camp? Isn't there something I can send you? Not a thing, Mother. Sure you have enough blankets at night? Absolutely certain. Why don't you let me give you the big comforter from the spare room? The, uh, pink one? Yes, dear. Well, I don't think it would fit in with the general color scheme of the barracks. Oh, I always think that pink goes with any color. They managed to keep us pretty warm down here, Mrs. Hadley. Really, Sergeant? Well, perhaps you know best, Ted. But you look tired, dear. I hope you're not trying to do too much. Not a bit more than is asked of me, Mother. Mother, don't baby him. I think he looks fine. Thanks, Pat. Hiya, Ted. Hiya, Sarge. How you doing? Hiya, Louie. How's it with you, Strangler? Strictly done nuts. Be seeing you. Be seeing you, Strangler. So long, Louie. Who was that? A friend of yours, Ted? <laughs> that was Louie. We call him the Strangler. He used to be a wrestling champion in Brooklyn. Indeed. And what did you do before the war, Sergeant? Oh, I was in the advertising department of the Washington Chronicle. The Chronicle, really? Oh, dear, just when everything was so peaceful. Why, what's the matter? Have I said something wrong, Mrs. Hadley? Mike, come on, Mike, let's dance, shall we? Sure, I'd like to. Well, come on, then. Excuse me. Mother, look. Yes, Ted? Don't get Mike wrong just because he's worked for the Chronicle. He's a real gent. Gentleman, darling. 
You mustn't let the army vulgarize you. Good night, Pat. I'm going straight to bed. Mother, I'd like to talk to you. In the morning, darling. I'm completely worn out. Please. It's important. Sit down, Mother. Pat, I do hope you're not going to tell me anything unpleasant. I'm not. Mother, I... Well... What is it, dear? Mother, do you remember the first time you met Father? Strange you should ask me that. I was recalling it tonight when I saw Teddy. He grows more like his father every day. Did you fall in love with Father right away? I suppose I must have. He was so handsome and dashing, I really couldn't help myself. You see, at the time, I was half engaged to Elliot, and... What is it you wanted to tell me, dear? I'm in love, too, Mother. With this soldier? Yes. You mustn't romanticize things, Patricia, dear. In times like these, one is apt to be carried away by the glamour of a uniform. Oh, I'd marry Mike if he were dressed in an old gunny sack. Has he asked you to marry him? I asked him. He's got his transfer to the Air Corps, and he's being sent out west. I couldn't let him go without letting him know how I felt. That was very forward and indiscreet of you, Patricia. I'm glad the young man is leaving. It'll give you time to think things over. I'm going with him. I'll be married first, of course. Married? Oh, Mother, you'll love him when you know him. Really, you will. I'm not thinking of myself. I'm thinking of you. I have no intention of entrusting your happiness to a man whom none of us knows. I know him. Ted knows him. Elliot knows him. Elliot knows him? Yes, I introduced them. You've been seeing Elliot Fulton after what he did to me. Mother, what Elliot did was the best possible thing that could have happened. Why, Ted's a new man. You've been carrying on with this young man behind my back, aided and abated by the man who sent your own brother to what may be his death. You're being hysterical and unfair. I suppose you think what Elliot did was fair. Yes, I do. You've always sided with him, always. You care more for him than you do for me? That's not true. If he means so much to you, why don't you go to him? He won't stand in the way of your marrying this nobody. But as your mother, I forbid it. All right, mother. Good night. Patricia, come back here this instant. Where are you going? To Elliot. Patricia! <laughs> Yes? I want to see Mrs. Hadley, please. May I have your card, madam? Card? I didn't think you needed one to get in. Who shall I say is calling, please? Just say Mrs. Michael Fitzpatrick, Mike's mother. I'll see if she's home. Yes, Bennett? There's a Mrs. Michael Fitzpatrick to see you, madam. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Show her in. Yes, madam. Mrs. Hadley will see you. I could have told you she would. Well, how do you do? Mrs. Fitzpatrick? That's it. <laughs> no need to ask who you are. You're the mother of your daughter and there's no denying it. Won't you sit down? Well, that uh, chair's a bit thin for the size of me. If you don't mind, I'll sit over here on the sofa. What is it you want, please? Mrs. Hadley, I'd not beat about the bush. I've come as a dove of peace. <laughs> Although you'd hardly think I was a dove to look at me. <laughs> if there's any peace to be made, I should think my daughter would call on me. She tried to call on you, but you turned her away. I sent word that I'd see her when she decided to move back home and give up the idea of this marriage. And what have you against her marrying my Michael? I have nothing against your son. In fact, I hardly know him. Ah, oh, that's easily cured. On the other hand, I see no reason why they shouldn't wait. At least until he's out of the army. Young people aren't much at waiting, Mrs. Hadley. Then it's up to us as older people to stop it. I did my best, but Patricia obviously decided to go elsewhere for her guidance and her love. She'll search high and low, but she'll not find the kind of love you can give her. Oh, come now, Mrs. Hadley. There's enough fighting going on in the world without a mother and a daughter having to go at it. Say you'll come to the wedding. The wedding? On Wednesday, at high noon, in the Church of the Immaculate Heart. And it won't be complete without you. Since I wasn't consulted about the wedding, I see no purpose in my being there. And why should you be consulted when you were all against it? And I see no purpose in continuing this discussion. Good afternoon, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. You're a proud woman, Mrs. Hadley. 
But I think you'll find that pride's not very good company when you're lonely. Good afternoon. And now, now I'd like to propose a toast to the bride and groom. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Fulton, a toast. Oh. <laughs> well, here's to a happy life in Phoenix and a speedy return to those who love you. And how about a toast to the mother of the groom? If you don't stop drinking toast, you'll all be sodden. <laughs> <laughs> to you, mother. <laughs> Darling. Well, I'm afraid I've got to get back to the department. That sounds familiar, Elliot. I'll go with you to the door. Not a step further. Remember, you're my wife. Oh, I don't think she's apt to forget that, Mike. Goodbye, sir, and thanks for everything. Goodbye, Mike, and lots of good luck. And take good care of her. It was a beautiful wedding, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Oh. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Ted. Goodbye, Mr. Fulton. Goodbye, Fulton. sir. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> well, Pat, are you happy? Terribly. Except for Mother. Yes, I know. You know, all during the ceremony, I was looking toward the door, hoping. Elliot, have I been selfish? Have I done everything I could? Well, everything short of wrecking your life and Mike's. I tried to phone her from the church. Bennett said she was out. Will you try to see her? Uh, I'm afraid she'll be out to me, too. Don't worry, Pat. She's a lot stronger than we suspect. Goodbye, Elliot. Goodbye, my dear. I'll miss you. I'll try to believe that. And lots of good luck to both of you. Thanks. Pat. Here I am, Mike. You've been gone for ages, do you know that? <laughs> Don't ever, ever leave me again, do you hear? I was half crazy with loneliness. Oh, Mike, darling. Come on, let's get out of here. All right. I'll run up and get my grips. Come on. Hey, they're going to run out on us, folks. Oh. You can't do that. Wait a minute. Pat, come back. Well, I guess that's that. <laughs> hey, Pat, aren't you ever going to throw that bridal bouquet? I need a husband, too. <laughs> All right. Now get back, everybody. Get back. No. No. Wait a minute. What's the matter, Pat? Look, I... If you don't mind, I won't throw the bouquet. I'm going to send it to someone. Ted, come here. Yes, Pat? Ted, give this to Mother from me. she gave me the flowers. They were for you, she said. Here, Mother. Her flower. Her wedding flower. Oh, Mother, <laughs> don't. <laughs> Mr. Ted, the telephone for you, sir. Thanks, Bennett. Hello? Yes? Uh, this is Hadley speaking, sir. Yes, sir. I understand, sir. Right away. I've got to go, Mother. But I thought they gave you permission to spend the night. All leaves have been canceled. It looks as if... as if we're being moved out. Teddy! Now, don't worry, Mother. They may only be sending me to a camp in another part of the country. No, no, I know what it is. First it was Pat, and now it's you. Teddy, my baby. They're taking you away from me. After a brief intermission, we'll hear Act Three of The War Against Mrs. Hadley, starring Edward Arnold and Faye Bainter, with Gene Rogers and Van Johnson. Now, here's our fashion scout, Libby Collins, with some news about figure problems for the women in our audience. Sounds a bit mathematical, Libby. Well, not exactly, Mr. Kennedy. Not the kind I'm thinking about. Though often when a woman subtracts from her figure, she adds to her poise and appearance. I want to pass along the good news that even with elastic fabrics rationed, we women are going to be able to solve our figure problems with girdles and foundations that fit well. New types of fabrics and ingenious new ways of cutting them have been worked out. So the new things can do a fine figure-slimming job with little or no elastic in them. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we're going to toss out the precious two-way stretch girdles and foundations we bought last year. Far from it. We want to make them last just as long as we can. And one of the best ways to do that is to lux them often so they never get really soiled 
And so perspiration doesn't harm the fibers. Yes, Lux Flakes take away soil and perspiration quickly and thoroughly. And with Lux, there's no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing to weaken elasticity. Girdles keep their fit better, last longer, with gentle Lux care. And that point about fit is especially true of the new things. With less elastic in them, it's more important than ever to protect fit with Lux. Yes, Libby, that's care experts advise. Makers of foundations and leading stores where they're sold advise Lux Flakes. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. One of our stars has a birthday today. We'll tell you about it when we bring them back after the play. Now the curtain rises on the third act of The War Against Mrs. Hadley, starring Edward Arnold and Faye Bainter with Gene Rogers and Van Johnson. Proud woman, Mrs. Hadley. But I think you'll find that pride's not very good company when you're lonely. Those were Mrs. Fitzpatrick's words, words of prophecy. Mrs. Hadley, alone in a busy world at war, tries vainly to keep alive a peaceful era which is gone. She has no friends now, except the faithful Cecilia, and those friends of another day to whom she occasionally writes. Pat is married and in Phoenix. And Ted is heaven knows where. The house is still and quiet without them. You'll find pride's not very good company. I had a letter from Ted last week. Dear mother. I've read it over 20 times. I still can't realize he's gone away from me. Our ship reaches its destination shortly, and maybe now we'll be seeing some action. Tony Winters is in our company. Laura Winters' son, Stella. I know how you feel about his mother, but Tony's a real gent. <laughs> Beg pardon, gentleman. And we've become great friends. In fact, knowing him has been the swellest thing that's happened to me in the Army. Don't worry about me, I'm in the pink. The only thing that's bothering me is the thought that you may be lonely. Pride's not very good company when you're lonely. Goodbye, Mother. Teddy. <laughs> Teddy. Mrs. Hadley, Mrs. Hadley. Bennett, what is it? It's Mr. Theodore. What's happened to him? Nothing. I mean everything. He's a hero. It says so in the paper. Look, look, Mrs. Hadley. Oh, I'm so nervous. Read it for me, Bennett. Yes, madam. Theodore Hadley, Washington youth, wins DSC for heroism. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, Mrs. Hadley. Yes, I know, but is he all right? Corporal Theodore Hadley was cited for conspicuous bravery under fire in an official communique just received. Hadley, according to the dispatch, had been instructed to seek out the location of an enemy machine gun emplacement. After the other four men in his unit had been shot down by Jap snipers, Corporal Hadley continued on alone, locating the machine gun nest and wiping it out with hand grenades, killing 15 Jap soldiers. He returned unharmed to his company. Oh. Corporal Hadley is the son of the late Nathaniel Hadley, once owner of the Washington Chronicle, and of Mrs. Hadley. Bennett, I want you to get me all the papers right away. Yes, madam. Even the Washington Chronicle? I want every one of them. Yes, Hurry. madam. Is Mrs. Hadley in? I want to see her, please. Who shall I say is calling? It's Mrs. Fitzpatrick, girl. Now hurry up. Millie, has Bennett returned? Oh. How are you, Mrs. Hadley? How do you do? You'll excuse me for puffing. I, I'm all out of breath. Won't you come in? Thank you kindly. <laughs> well, I, I suppose you've heard the good news. Yes, I just saw it in the paper. The paper, is it? Is nothing sacred from those gossip mongers? I'm afraid I don't understand. I was speaking of my son. Young Ted? Well, what's happened to him? He's just been awarded the DSC. That's the Distinguished Service Cross. The saints preserve us. Who'd have thought it? Teddy's always been courageous, even as a child. Of course he has. And it's proud you should be to have a hero for a son. Think of all the stories we'll be able to tell our grandchild about his uncle. Grandchild? Is Patricia having a baby? Heaven help us. I thought you knew by now. No. Not a word. That's not like Pat. Whatever may have happened between you, 
It's still your grandchild she's bearing. When did you hear? Just a short while back. And I dropped everything to run over and compare notes with you on how it felt to be a grandmother. I'm afraid I can't say. Not having been informed officially. Mrs. Hadley, I hope you'll excuse me, but in the excitement over Mr. Theodore, I forgot this telegram, madam. Oh, thank you, Ben. Sorry, madam. There, there, you see, I knew it. I knew it wasn't like them. Uh, what does it say? You are going to be a grandmother in October. We love you and miss you very much. Pat and Mike. Not a word did they say in my telegram about missing me. I do hope Patricia takes proper care of herself. Oh, Michael will see to that. If he doesn't, I'll beat the daylights out of him. Mrs. Hadley. Yes? It's the reporters, madam. Reporters? Yes, madam, five of them. They insist upon seeing you about Mr. Theodore. I have nothing to say to them. What? Why, of course you have. I beg your pardon? You forget you're the mother of a hero. I don't see why my private life is any concern of the press. There's a war going on, Mrs. Hadley. And there's hundreds of thousands of wives and mothers needing all the courage they can get. Their men can't all win the DSC, but they're fighting just the same. And it's up to you to give their women folk a message of hope and faith. You've got no private life anymore. You belong to those wives and mothers. So you'll see them, Mrs. Hadley, and right now. Come in, boys. Mrs. Hadley, I'm Stevens of the Chronicle. The Chronicle? The name of Hadley means a lot to us. We'd like to play it up in a big way. I'm afraid I have nothing to say. We just want to ask you a few questions, Mrs. Hadley. But I told you... Have you heard from your son lately? I had a letter the other day. Where was it from? What did he say? The letter was personal. I see no object in going on with this. You already know the facts. But we'd like your angle, Mrs. Hadley. If Mrs. Winters is willing to give us an interview, you certainly ought to. Mrs. Winters? Yes, we've just come from there. <laughs> Some people like publicity. I wouldn't call losing a son good publicity. What? Guess we'd better call it a day. Come on. No. No, no, wait, please. I, I didn't know. Well, it was in the paper. I didn't read it. Please believe me. Of course she didn't. Haven't you got two eyes among the lot of you? I'm very sorry, Mrs. Hadley. Tony Winters was with your son, looking for the same machine gun nest. He was shot by a sniper. Oh, how dreadful. Why, only the other day Teddy wrote about him. They were great friends. Yes, so Mrs. Winters told us. She saw you at a time like this? Yes, she did. Bennett, you'll find a letter from Mr. Theodore on my night table. I want you to bring it here. Yes, madam. I'd like to read you parts of it. Especially the part about Tony Winters. Mrs. Winters. Mrs. Winters, ma'am. Oh, uh, yes, Anna. Mrs. Hadley is here, ma'am. Mrs. Hadley? I... I hope I'm not intruding. Please come in, Mrs. Hadley. Thank you. I'm so glad you came. Won't you sit down? I have a letter from my son. I brought it along. I thought you might like to hear what Ted said about Tony. Yes. Yes, I should. Very much. He says, Tony Winters is in our company. I know how you feel about his mother, but Tony is a real gent. Beg pardon, gentlemen. <laughs> That's just a little joke we have. And we've become great friends. In fact, knowing him has been the swellest thing that's happened to me in the army. I can't tell you how much that means to me. I just wanted you to know how Ted felt about him. Tony felt the same way about him. I'm glad they were together when... Oh, it could so easily have been my boy instead of yours. We should both be very proud of our sons. <laughs> Please don't cry. I've just heard today they're giving Tony the Distinguished Service Cross, too. I'm glad. And I'm so sorry for so many things. None of that matters now. Fights, political differences, anything. All that matters is that you and I, all of us work together
to make what Tony died for something fine and lasting. waiting for you. How are you? All right. You're looking very well, Stella. Thank you. Stella, I'm here on official business. The president sent me. The president? Yes, he asked me to deliver this letter to you personally. Elliot, will you read it to me? Yes, of course. My dear Mrs. Hadley, I want to offer my congratulations on the valor shown by your son and on the award of the Distinguished Service Cross, which he so heroically earned. I had the pleasure of knowing your husband, and though he opposed many of my policies, I always found him a fair opponent and a fearless fighter. I'm glad he has handed down this heritage to his son. I know that every American must share with you in your justifiable pride. Yours sincerely, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oh, Elliot, to think of his finding time to write to me when he has so many things to do. He must be a very remarkable man. Attention, please. I just wanted to tell you there'll be a new shipment of wool in tomorrow and more material for bandages. Now, while I'm gone, Laura Winters will be in charge. And I'm sure you'll all work just as hard as if I were here. Are there any questions? Oh, Stella. Yes, Cecilia. Stella, do I have to take the first aid course all over again? We all have to take it until we pass our examinations. Oh, I'm tired of being bandaged. <laughs> How long will you be in Phoenix, Stella? Probably not more than a week. I'll be right back after the baby's born. It'll be born before we get there if you don't hurry. <laughs> it's all right, Maggie, don't worry. I never missed a train in my life. There's always a first time for everything. Where is that husband of yours? Is he going to take us to the station? He's probably held up in a conference at the department. You know how important these conferences are. Well, where's your car? Elliot and I decided to put it up for the duration. Uh, Stella, Hello, Stella. darling. Uh, hello, dear. Yeah, I brought you some flowers. Elliot, I thought you said we were going to economize. Well, let's start tomorrow. I hope you know how much I'm going to miss you while you're away. That's what you get for marrying a grandmother. Come on, come on. This is no time for spooning. All right, all right, Goodbye. Maggie. Come on, will you? Goodbye, Stella. Goodbye. 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 I do hope the baby waits until you get there. Goodbye, Stella. I hope it's a boy. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, those Japs and Nazis better look out now that Stella's in the war. Why, Stella, did you forget something? Where is that? Here, here it is. Well, what is it? I almost forgot my letter from the president. Goodbye. 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 You have heard the story of Stella Hadley, of her doubts and her decision. May we all profit by her example and realize as she did the moral and military necessity of sacrifice to speed the day of victory. Now, before our stars return for a curtain call, here's something that sounds like a contradiction, but it's true. Part of the hard wear your stockings get comes when you're not wearing them. For example, if you let your stockings lie around without being luxed after you've worn them, the perspiration left in the fabric can weaken the threads so the stockings wear out too quickly. Yes, it's important for good wear to wash stockings promptly after every wearing. And it's important to do it the gentle Lux Flakes way. For if you wash stockings the wrong way, if you rub them with cake soap or use strong soap, you're actually adding to the wear and tear. Those things weaken the elastic qualities of your stockings. Then the tiny threads break easily into runs. 
but gentle Lux flakes take away soil and perspiration quickly and very gently without weakening elasticity. You cut down runs, your stockings will look better, last longer when you Lux them after every wearing. Get the thrifty big box of Lux flakes first thing tomorrow. It will do stockings every night for months. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. It isn't news when Faye Bainter and Edward Arnold give fine performances because we expect it of them, and we're never disappointed. But I did discover some news about Faye Bainter today. This is her birthday. Well, many happy returns, Faye. <laughs> You certainly picked an exciting day. I had nothing to do with it, Eddie. Aren't you going to ask me how old I am? No, not me. My mama done told me. (laughs) She said, never ask a lady's age. (laughs) Eddie, I I think it'd be all right to ask Faye how old she was when she played her first part. Four, Mr. DeMille. Then I retired until I was 14. (laughs) (laughs) And it's obvious your comeback was successful, Faye. When did your career get underway, Eddie? Oh, I was about 14 years old, too. A mere beardless boy, Eddie. Oh, no, not exactly. I played character parts and wore a beard most of the time. (laughs) Well, this audience knows two good troopers when we find them. I was thinking tonight that there's something in that word trooper that fits 130 million Americans now. We're better neighbors because we've made sacrifices together. The missing faces around the family dinner table... Draw us all closer. Eddie Arnold, for instance, has sent a son to the Army. And you have a boy in the same service, C.B.? Faye Bainter's husband, a fine naval officer in the last war, directs civilian defense in the city of Santa Monica. And we stand side by side with millions of other mothers and fathers doing what we can. And trying to be good troopers about it. What play have you planned for next week, Mr. DeMille? A famous screenplay that's very timely at the moment, Faye. It's called Algiers. And our stars will be Charles Boyer and Loretta Young. (laughs) Algiers, Algiers is a a city that's made for drama. And it's certainly lived up to its reputation in the past few weeks. Next Monday night, we'll bring you a thrilling love story of this fascinating town with Charles Boyer in his great role of Pepe Lamoco, and Loretta Young as his leading lady. Oh, that's a great idea right now, C.B. My congratulations, and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. (laughs) There's no rationing on talents like yours. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents... Loretta Young and Charles Boyer in Algiers with J. Carol Nash and Jean Lockhart. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Attention, housewives. Is your kitchen part of American war production? Are you helping to make munitions? Do you save waste kitchen fats? If you don't, start tomorrow. Put all leftover fats in a clean, wide-top can and take them to your meat dealer regularly. He'll pay you for them, and they'll be used to make glycerin. Glycerin makes explosives. So send your waste fats to war. Out of the frying pan, into the firing line. During the holiday season, the volume of mail increases approximately 200%. The public should not delay any longer to mail Christmas gifts, greetings, and letters if they wish to make certain that they are received before December 24th. Heard in tonight's play were Fred Mackay as Theodore, Verna Felton as Mrs. Fitzpatrick, Anne O'Neill as Cecilia. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Charles Boyer and Loretta Young with J. Carol Nash and Jean Lockhart in Algiers. Shake off that fagged out, half alive, vitamin deficient feeling. Try VIMS. Thousands depend on VIMS to help guard against colds. 
help build extra energy. VIMS have vitamins A, C, and D, and three essential B-complex vitamins, also three minerals. Remember, VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals, VIMS. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>